That was everything I painted in 2023. We're gonna be talking about the good, the bad, what I'm proud of, and honestly, even stuff I can't believe I'm sharing on YouTube. Okay, so we are gonna start at the very beginning. The beginning of last year, after having my daughter, first thing I actually did was a painted monogram for her because we had to send announcements and thank you cards to people who gave us gifts. And so I did a watercolor monogram of her initials, which I thought was really cute. I figured I'd start with that because you'll see that over the course of this year, becoming a mom of two has been a huge deal for me. As many moms will know, going from one to two is, <laughs> it's, it's a big deal. As we get through the year, I will talk a lot about that, just truth be told, because that's my experience. And my experience is reflected very much in my art. This first deck is gonna be all the pieces from my other business. So my non-point brush business, not the ballerinas, but the social stationery, the weddings, which is my primary business, actually. It's really what foots the bill. Although I will say that point brush and YouTube have been creeping in there and kind of balancing out the scale. We do a lot of, illustrations and stationery for events that are happening worldwide. This one being one that took place in, can you guess? Florence. And this is kind of a cheat because the first half, so this half was actually done many years ago, but I had to complete this half. So I figured it counts towards this year, doesn't it? I think it does. So I took artistic liberties. The Duomo is here and then the Ponte Vecchio is here. And the, but if you actually were there and were to take a picture, the distances would not be so compressed. I just did that so that I could fit everything within this frame. Then this is actually a, I don't know if you can tell, but it's in a triangular shape. And that's because this ended up being artwork for an envelope flap. If you look at it like this, and I were to turn it over like that, return address went here and I didn't actually bother with painting the other side because I knew that on Photoshop I was going to take all this stuff and basically flip it over. So all I really needed to do was to illustrate this half, although I did end up going a little bit extra. Sometimes in order to go quicker and to be able to meet my deadlines, I can just fast track and not really not have to finish something in the same way that I would have to if I was doing this as a private commission or something and somebody was going to frame this and put it up on their wall. Then here we have some spot illustrations. In the industry, when we refer to spot illustrations, what we mean is illustrations that are going to be used as individual elements in different spots. So in this case, this was for the dress code on an events card. So casual attire, formal attire, and these little umbrellas were for a map of Italy. You'll have some bits and pieces of that map here. So this is a ring, some trees, this is actually the Peninsula Hotel for a map of Paris. Can you guess what this is? This is the Brooklyn Bridge. So this one, I, I think I was basing this on a sketch that I had in a sketchbook. And then in order to do the etching, what I did was I ended up using tracing paper with micron pen to get that ink on paper kind of effect. Then we have a couple's dogs. And I think this was for cocktail napkins, believe it or not. They have two beautiful golden retrievers, or is it Labradors? I don't remember, but they wanted to have their dogs on their napkins during the reception, which I think is lovely because they are part of the family. So this is them, the two puppies. Then we have, what is this? This is, again, spot illustrations for a map of Paris. So you see there's the Paris Opera House, the Arc de Triomphe, the, the Arc of Triumph, the Eiffel Tower, Musée d'Orsay, this is the Impressionist Museum, Jardin du Luxembourg, which is where, right next to where my grandma lives. So all of these, again, are little illustrations, especially when you're working with clients, you wanna have as much flexibility as possible because just because I like the way that looks doesn't mean that the client shares that opinion. One of the things I learned very early on in my profession is that you have to stay as flexible and as nimble as possible because everything is subjective. So just because you like something, even the color, and we'll get to that in a second on another piece that I did where the client was not so happy with the color of what I did. And that was a lesson learned because I, I, I'm not perfect. And as I move forward in my business and in my experience, I very often tweak how I work. So let me show you an example of that in practice. So this was a, a watercolor of an interior of a palazzo in Florence. What I usually do with my clients is I will present them with a pencil sketch of what their 
illustration will look like. And before anything gets painted, I say, are you happy with it? If there are any changes you want to make to it, make them now, because once I paint it, it's locked. So that's how I work. I give them the outline, the draft, and once they're happy with it, I go ahead and paint it. But what I didn't realize, and what was new this time around, is that I thought that the client would want something based on exactly the color scheme and the photo reference that they sent me. So they sent me a photo reference of what this interior looked like from their travels and when they went and visited the place. And I figured, okay, well, this is what they sent me in terms of the photo, let's follow the colors. And I didn't realize that they had something completely different in mind in terms of the color scheme than what was actually there. And that was, I don't want to put that on them because it was my, it's my job as the illustrator to ask these questions. And that was something that I wasn't ready for. So what ended up happening is I ended up having to repaint it in this much paler kind of champagne and gold and very different feel Throughout this process, I kind of realized that I need to present my client from now on swatches of exactly what colors will be delivered on the painting. Lesson learned and always fine tuning my process as I go. Next is another landscape. This one is for a castle in Scotland. This one was a lot of fun to paint. Sometimes I, like a, a venue or, or architecture will resonate with me and this one was one of them. As did this one, which was a venue in Tuscany. Beautiful yellow facade, very, very, very Italian. This one was done, actually a lot of these were done using primarily Roman Schmall. And Roman Schmall this year has been, actually two brands, Roman Schmall, M. Graham were my top, top paints this year. Spot illustrations for the next illustration here, which is of a venue in upstate New York. Well, the idea here was I wanted to have, again, flexibility. So I painted this landscape individually and I knew the client wanted to have these florals integrated somehow. So these are bleeding hearts and these are roses. And so what I ended up doing was scanning these and placing them on the computer after the fact so I could play with the proportions since I wasn't really sure what the client wanted in terms of how big or how small or where exactly she wanted them to be. I decided to keep some flexibility there so that I could play around on the computer afterwards. Hope that makes sense. Okay, next we have, this one is an illustration of somewhere in the Malfi Coast. A bunch of gouache being used here, I realized, for the white waves because I didn't mask them out. I was kind of lazy too. So that is it for the stationary business. I'm excited to get to the next section, which is the YouTube stuff. So YouTube stuff, I want to show you that because I've spoken a lot about how a lot of YouTubers make it seem like it's so easy and so quick to get these beautiful illustrations done. And I want to show you a little bit of my process of how I sometimes have to rehearse and do tests beforehand to get the right feel and to figure out what I'm going to do with my painting because they don't always end up great. At some point I've rehearsed it enough, kind of like a dancer rehearses the steps to be able to do it on camera, but painting on camera does not come naturally to me. And I don't think it comes naturally to most people. A lot of these are tutorials that are on YouTube. This was the Monet inspired tutorial. I did it twice. Actually, no, I did it more than twice. There were two others that I, I must have thrown away. Unfortunately, I, I think I'm going to make it a practice of keeping all this stuff, especially the stuff that gets thrown away, which I did during the second portion of last year because I, I wanted to show this to you guys. I think it's really important too. But, um, but yeah, so you can see how this was actually the first one, which I did with handmade watercolors. And I realized halfway through painting it that most people are not painting with handmade watercolors and it doesn't make sense to show something that granulates and has these very weird properties and to stick with something that's more mainstream in terms of the actual pigments. So this one has ultramarines and quinacridones, ochre, that kind of thing. Whereas these ones were from the 31 Purple Fish palette. And I will link the video about handmade watercolors right here so you can check it out. But as you can see, the effect is very different between the two. I love them both for different reasons, but I think I nailed the lotus on this one more than I did this one. What do you think? Then the next one is, okay, so this one was just a swatching session and I wasn't really expecting anything great from this one, but I ended up loving how it turned out. And this was for my swatching video of the Holbein watercolors, the haul that my mom brought back from Japan. 
Let's get to the next one. I did so many versions of this before actually recording the final one because I was not happy with anything. And truth be told, as much as I might seem confident here on YouTube, I am often painting and being like, everyone's gonna think I suck so much because <laughs> people always seem to be doing amazing stuff on camera. And I, I am not as confident as you might think I am <laughs> because I'm teaching and I'm telling people what to do. But I have the same skeletons as most people. So this one was for the Matisse inspired video. I loved how that video turned out, mostly because not because of how this turned out or because of the actual video, but mostly because it seemed to inspire a lot of you to loosen up and, and not take things so seriously. And we're so hard on ourselves that um, I think we need that, we need that free pass. Okay, so here's where I'm gonna show you, yeah, some of the process stuff. This is a watercolor I did for the Picasso video. So this was all about Picasso and inspiration and how I go about the whole theme of the video was how to steal like an artist. And we did a whole heist kind of theme. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I'm gonna link it here. But I went through many iterations of this before I found this voice. So this one, I believe, was the first one. Then there was this one, which felt a little flat and I didn't like how the faces turned out. Wasn't super happy with it, but it was a learning experience. I feel like by seeing this, I realized what I didn't want to do. Then there was this one. Very interesting to see the progression, right? Like, I just want to show you how I got from point A to what ended up being my final. So you can see like from here to here, to here, to here, there was like a whole learning experience of playing around with scale and what elements I was gonna bring in, what the color scheme was gonna end up looking like. I taped all of them and it ended up deleting everything except for this one. So nothing is linear. You don't just come up with your brush and just start making this like, amazing thing. Not that I think that this is all that amazing. There's always a progression. Even for somebody like me who's been doing this for over 20 years, there's always a progression. You don't just like whip out something out of nowhere. It just doesn't work that way. And if it does, then you know what? Why are you watching this? Just go paint and be awesome. <laughs> be awesome because clearly you know what you're doing. So yes, this was the Picasso one. This was the dark florals one. And I ended up doing, gosh, I made six of these, maybe seven. <laughs> and I recorded every single one of them, but ended up liking how the video turned out, even though this is not my favorite piece, not because I don't like it, just maybe it's lacking ballerinas. <laughs> That's probably what it is. So this was for the dark Dutch floral inspired tutorial. Then we have these, and this one was another tutorial that I did. This was the first one that I did to kind of figure out what I was going to do. And then this one I actually filmed. But yeah, another one where I, I did it multiple times to figure out what I was doing. Then the anemone tutorial, more trial and error. This one is the one that ended up in the actual tutorial. But I did this one that I realized, oh, I don't think it's a good idea to have that many colors because it might be more difficult for beginners to follow. Then I tried this one and I wasn't happy with something. I don't remember what I wasn't happy with. Then I did this one and I was pretty happy with this one. I said, I said okay, I think this is the one I'm gonna base it off of. And then from this, I ended up filming tutorial, which was this one. Again, a complete evolution. <laughs> So hopefully this you know, helps to show you that we all struggle. We all have our struggles, we all have our demons, and we all have that little voice inside us that says, it's not good enough. And people will think you suck. <laughs> I swear, it happens to us all. All right, now I'm excited for the fun part, which is the ballerina part. And I'm gonna start with the floral stuff, which was, so this was sort of an extension of the Waltz of the Flowers collection that I did two years ago. And the reason why I did an extension is because I ended up wanting to design a planner that took the Waltz of the Flowers as the main source of inspiration and to extend that to 12 months of the year. And so I'm gonna put an image of what some of those months look like and what ended up happening. But I had a lot of the base illustrations, but I was still lacking some for a few of the months and even some spot illustrations, keyword there. I did these two, which I thought were really fun, really kind of like a new look at that theme. And funny enough, these were actually inspired by being outside during the springtime with my kids. And so I ended up seeing, was it like a, a not a frog? No, I didn't see a frog. What did I see? 
Oh no, the frog came from a frog toy that my son had lying around the house. And then the butterflies and the flowers were inspired by the animals and some of the critters and, and insects that were flying around in our yard during the springtime. So as you can see, inspiration can be everywhere. You just have to be open to finding it and to catching it, writing it down. And I have a video about that if you wanna check it out. So that, that was this. This one was sort of a take on, I was trying to figure out what the tone and what the coloration and style was gonna be like for these. And this was one of the first takes that I had of, of that idea. And I, I was interested and intrigued about incorporating pen and ink along with watercolor. And I think that there's something to that idea. I just don't think this was the right place for it, but I did think it was very intriguing and still do. I will re-explore this in the future. Next, we have a lot of spot illustrations. So, ooh. Random pear, <laughs> I don't know what that was about. I had some sunflowers that I did about a year and a half ago, and I needed elements to go with that to be able to build a wreath around it. I figured sunflower seeds would be a great little addition, so I did that those separately, which I then incorporated together in Photoshop after the fact. So these were those spot illustrations for that. These little flowers were for the watermelon. So these are watermelon flowers. Hated this paper. This is Fabriano's 1712 or I don't know. It's four numbers. It's a year. It's like awful paper. I love Fabriano. Do not like that paper. Do not buy it. It's awful. <laughs> it's going to go into like next year's worst art supplies uh, video or something because I, I absolutely hated it. But I, I did, you know, nothing goes to waste. So I ended up doing some of these small illustrations on that paper. This was the illustration that I did using Christy Rice's dagger and several other brushes that she uses, as well as her paints. Loved how this ended up. This was inspired by iris flowers. Ended up looking more like orchids. I liked it. I think the colors were something that I wouldn't have necessarily orchestrated on my own, but Christy Rice's palette really pushed me there. All right, next one. This one ended up being my cover for the planner. So this is actually all gouache on black paper. And as you can see, the effect is very different. Gouache being a much flatter, closer to acrylics than in any of the other paints. I don't usually paint with acrylics because I, I hate the feeling of them. <laughs> it's just one of those things I dislike. It's a personal thing. But this what ended up being the cover for my planner. And I planned it, plan it, I planned it, pun intended, around the idea that I was gonna have the typography here in the center, the, the year, point brush planner, or whatever it is I put on there in the center. Um, oh, another example. So these were trial runs, which I wasn't, didn't love, didn't love either one of these, but these were trial runs before I ended up illustrating this one, figuring out what kind of composition I wanted to do, how big I wanted the flowers to be how many of them I wanted on the, on the page, what the color scheme was. And I ended up feeling like I needed a lot more white space because there was something kind of too aggressive about them when they're so big like that, that you need a little bit more white space to, to make it feel more balanced. This was just a quick study, trying to work with some, what was this? This was another Roman Schmaltz, I gotta say, really showed up. Just love his paints, really an amazing paint maker. These were spot illustrations, which I was gonna then compose into a wreath with mushrooms being the inspiring idea. Ladybug, which I loved in her fishnets. I don't know if you can see her right here. She has, she's wearing her little fishnets. Again, more spot illustrations. This was for the sunflower wreath. These were daisies for a daisy wreath for the month of, I wanna say April, maybe, I don't know, not sure. But one of the months with a little bumblebee and her little furry tutu. And then these I loved as well. These were autumn leaves. It was a toss up between autumn leaves and dahlias for the month of November, I believe. Something about the autumn leaves with the reds and the and those, those fall colors, just I loved. That's what I ended up doing. So that concludes the florals. I'm gonna go through the random pile and then the Christmas pile next. So Christmas, random. Let's do random first. This one was, actually this was, this was another YouTube one. So this was my YouTube tutorial for how to paint a ballerina. Because it's a ballerina subject, it was much easier for me to paint on camera than most other things. This was another series called Dancers Among Us. I love being able to connect with my audience, both here as well as on Instagram. So I wanted to give a little nod to my community and represent dancers of all walks of life, of all colors, of all backgrounds, just dancing together. And so I've got the mom, I've got the doctor, I have 
the chemist, the veteran or the, the military family. I got a, I got a vet, another vet, 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 both vets, the artist, the teacher, the chef, the astronaut, just people in different walks of life. And I, I love being able to make people smile and bring joy to people's lives through my art. Okay, let's keep moving. This is Don Q, Don Quixote, a famous ballet. And this was a little bit of my stepping stone into the next part of last year, the more artsy stuff, the stuff that I'm, I'm really into right now. Getting a little bit looser, more painterly. This one was a Baroque inspired one. Oh, this was May the 4th be with you. 4th of July, people in the ballet community like to say, may the 4th be with you. 4th being 4th position, which is this position in ballet. So Leia, <laughs> in point shoes, um, kind of striking her best 4th position. Then we have these. So this was actually, you might have seen this in last year's what I painted this year. And this was an unfinished piece and I wasn't really sure what to do with it. I ended up painting it this year, got damaged, unfortunately. But instead of gouache, I ended up doing in watercolors, which ended up being the right choice because I was able to really echo and mimic that gauzy, sheer, transparent feel. This was my father's day illustration for Instagram. Uh, got shared a lot because I think it just resonated with a lot of people and something about this makes me smile. I see my husband and my daughter's not big enough to do that yet, but um, I definitely see him and I see my own dad in there too. Yeah. Uh, all right, so then we have this. A little bit of a segue into where we're gonna go. Another one of those segues. You can see it's starting to get looser, more colorful, kind of crazier and less contained, less, um, less tight than my other pieces. This one was another pale one. I don't know, I'm not really that fond of it. Oh, my spiders, my spiders. And spiders, I have a very severe arachnophobia. I am very, very afraid of spiders and creepy crawlies. And so this was my way of <laughs> processing that a little bit because one thing that has happened this year is that instead of having my art studio in my typical location, which is upstairs in my, in my bedroom, I had to move everything to the basement. So I am recording this video and I do most of my painting in the basement now, which is just teeming with creepy crawlies. We've got crickets, we've got spiders, we've got centipedes. It's awful for somebody, someone like me who's afraid. And I don't mean like I'm just scared. I mean like I will drop everything and start running away. <laughs> I just, ugh. So yes, this was kind of my, my Halloween ode to, to the spiders in my space. That is that. And then we're gonna get into Christmas stuff before I move into my favorites of this year. A really important holiday um, and important in terms of being a business owner, especially for Point Brush. I sell a lot of art prints. I sell a lot of products during the holiday season and the Nutcracker pays the bills, both in the ballet world as well as in Point Brush world. So this year I did a few pieces. I wanted to take a lot of the characters from the Nutcracker and incorporate them into what's known as a freeze. So a F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, freeze. That's actually just a, a long panel of, it can be whatever subject matter. So a freeze could be a, a landscape, it could be a very long panoramic landscape. In my case, I wanted to do all the characters one after the other so that I could wrap it onto products like a mug or a t-shirt. So I illustrated all these pieces. So I have Clara, Drosselmeyer, I have the soldier, I have the mouse king, I have the sugar plum fairy and her cavalier, I have candy cane, all these pieces that I then stitched together in two formats. I had one freeze, the long landscape format, and I re-puzzle pieced it together in an eight by 10 format. So that's, again, if you're doing something for commercial purposes, having that flexibility gives you the ability to move things around and do things on the fly very rapidly. Same thing here, I illustrated these ornaments um, and I did them on a white background, but I knew that I wanted them to be on something that was very Christmas tree-like. So I ended up illustrating this texture of pine leaves, and I knew that I was gonna superimpose them after the fact. But the reason again why I did it separately was I wasn't really sure if I wanted it to be at this scale. Maybe I would double the scale, or maybe I would reduce it. Maybe I would, I, I wanted it this, like, 
the pine cones facing down or pine cones facing up or not pine cones, pine leaves facing up versus down or maybe at an angle. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do and being able to do it as two separate pieces would give me the flexibility to do that. Next up we have snowflakes. So I did two iterations of these. This one was done using just regular, regular paints. Ultramarine, I believe, was the color I used for that. And then this one was done using a very special blend. Some people thought it was, I forgot the name of it. There's like some brand that sells this spray or this special paint. This was actually from a handmade watercolor manufacturer that does what's known as pigment salts. And what it is, is a combination of several pigments as well as salt, so that when you drop it in, it does these very curious effects. And it's not just granulation, it's these, I call this piece snap, crackle, pop, because it's like this candy that crackles, and I find it very magical. And so I'm, I've been playing a lot with that because I find it a very interesting texture that is unlike salt, but, but yeah, I find it very different, so I, I like that. Then we have this. I never finished this, and this was actually, the reason why I didn't finish this is this one was actually inspired by a piece that I saw from Dior. And I stopped doing it because I was inspired by it, and I realized halfway through the painting that it was way too close to the original than I was comfortable with. And so once you get too close, as much as you love it, you gotta walk away. And I think this one was one of those things where the idea I feel like I can steal that idea, but this was too close to plagiarism, so I decided to walk away. I will re-explore this idea, which I love, which is the ballerinas in the windows. So at the, at the bottom level, you have a ballet store, and then through the windows, you're seeing all sorts of different uh, activities and people preparing for the holidays, but this particular configuration, I wasn't comfortable with. Next one here, this one was my nod to the great illustrator and Disney artist, Mary Blair. This one was inspired by her It's a Small World After All ride in Disneyland, I believe it is. I wanted it to be Toyland meets the Land of the Sweets, but with ballet. And so I did my little take on it with my own colorations and there's a little cookie there, a frosted cookie. And I kind of built this one to be able to be stacked. So if I needed to take this and duplicate it, it would go on forever. So you could wrap it around a lot of things. You could wrap it around a mug or a tote bag. And then the last one is my Christmas tree. I wanted to do another one, one with a very pale pink and white base, and then for her to have this very deep mahogany skin tone. But yeah, I think this one will end up being maybe a pear, a trio at some point. Next year, I'll get around to it and, and add to it but this was my Christmas series. Okay, this is the part of the video where it might get a little bit heavier because this is the part where it's more, where I'm not painting for other people, I'm painting for myself. Coming back to being a mom, I actually struggled and I haven't spoken about that a lot here on YouTube, but um, I battled postpartum depression last year, which was something that it was very difficult. I don't know how much to talk about it on here because this is an art channel. On the one hand, art does reflect what happens in our lives, right? It's sort of like a, it's a lens through which we process our emotions and what's going on in our lives. But at the same time, I, I also don't want to unload on you guys. But I do want to touch on that because there is a lot of that that kind of leaked into my artwork. So let's start with these. I kind of call this my Pollock phase. And some of these paintings were as a result of me being all over the place in terms of very scattered. I don't know if you can tell. There's like a, a sense of like urgency and scatteredness. I went from painting sitting down to painting standing up for, for my personal work. And that was not a conscious decision in terms of I'm going to do this standing up. It really was functionally because I was constantly having to run back and forth between the kids and taking care of people, that it was very difficult for me to just sit down in place and just paint. So a lot of times I felt more comfortable just standing up with a brush, getting a couple brush strokes in to just suddenly take off and, and pick up a toddler off the floor because she's about to, I don't know, put a, put a Lego in her mouth. That sense of quickness and spontaneity, you can see it in my artwork and it's because I was very scattered during that time period. I started off with this one, which was an exploration of texture and pattern and color. 
And all of these going forward are all gonna be, for the most part, using M-Gram because that is what I found to be the paint that I enjoyed most for my personal work. So we've got, I call these my stalactites because they're sharper. I experimented with foam brushes for this one, which I think I mentioned in another video, softer edges on this one. And these two kind of led me to this one, which ended up being maybe the blueprint from, for some of the larger pieces, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I really loved this one because it incorporated more color. So these ones were very uniform, just pinks and oranges. And then this one had a broader palette, still in the analogous color family. Analogous meaning right next to each other on the color wheel. But there was something that had more depth to these ones. And I, I did add facial features, which I'm not so sure whether or not that was a good idea or not. Because in the following paintings, you'll see that I go from being more literal to fuzzing and not really caring so much about things like faces or lips or details quite as much. This is one that I did in a span of 15 minutes while my son was having a snack and my daughter was napping. <laughs> and as you can see, it's frantic, it's quick, it's, um, it's joyful and yet I wasn't at that time. I really wasn't. But the colors are, are fantastic. I really love this one. Again, M. Graham dries with a beautiful punchiness that in my opinion, is unparalleled. These ones were exploring that same theme, added some silver to it. They're drippy, they're wild. This one feels a little bit more conflicted psychologically. I don't know, but I think it does. I did a lot of the torsos in the previous ones. We have upper bodies, we have heads. And then I was curious, what happens if I add legs? So that's what I did. I did upper bodies and I added legs. And then I realized, oh my goodness, I don't have to add anything else because your eyes can actually fill in some of the blanks for costume is there, what the faces look like and what kind of story is going on. And I find that idea really interesting in art, how omission allows the viewer to project what we wanna see. And I think that that's a really great way of being more interactive and maybe even more engaging with your artwork is to leave out some areas on purpose, leave room for the viewer to make their interpretations. So this one was a little bit of that. And I transformed this one into a pattern that was a repeat pattern. And it's all just about bodies, bodies of different colors and in different positions. And you can, you can fill in the blanks. All right, then we have this one, which was torn up. I was not happy with this. This was kind of my first take at a larger piece. And what I didn't like about it, I'll just tell you what I didn't like and why I tore it up. I was trying to add a layer of watercolor ink and what watercolor inks do, which is really interesting, once they've dried, they are not reactivated by water like how watercolor and how gouache are. And so I was playing around with the idea of adding a blanket so that it would allow me the ability to create another layer and not reactivate layers underneath. Did not work at all. I think the idea is still there. I think it's a, a cool idea to re-explore, but this just got way too muddy and it's just, it's just sad looking. So that's why I tore it up. It's good paper though. So this will be reused for swatching or something. Um, but this, the knowledge of this is what brought me to my next painting. They're actually out of sequence, I apologize. This one was the one that turned out right. So it took me this to get to here. And this painting is actually, it's inspired by my favorite ballet, which is a ballet known as Serenade. It's a neoclassical ballet by the choreographer George Balanchine. And neoclassical just means it's not one of the classic traditional ones like Sleeping Beauty or Nutcracker, that kind of thing. It's a more contemporary choreography. So I, I used that as the backbone. And the, 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 the reason why I mentioned that at all is, is that Serenade has these beautiful blue costumes and the whole thing is in this very ethereal blue color scheme. And the lighting is very particular and that's what I wanted to echo here. Um, and this one was actually sold. So this will be going to its new owner in the coming weeks. And then last but not least from this series, I have this piece, which is very similar to the other ones. And you can see how I went from here to here. And this is the building blocks and the foundation, the studies to get me to these larger pieces. And I really enjoyed working larger. There was something about, maybe it's because I was standing up that felt like the style allowed me to use more of my body and be more expressive. And again, here, there is a lot of emotion coming out on here. It's colorful yet chaotic, beautiful, but somehow, conflicted about it, 
which I think kind of sums up my experience of last year. Maybe the two sides of being an artist, being a mom, learning how to do both. So these are the foundation for what took me to what I consider to be my favorite part of last year. So here we go, and I'm gonna adjust my cameras a little bit so that you can see everything a little bit better. This was a piece that I did at the height of my depression. I was very lost. It was very, a very difficult transition for me, especially being somebody who, who finds her work and what I do in my paintings so rewarding to not find that joy anymore. And I wasn't finding that joy at the beginning of last year. I was painting a lot and I, I have to because it is what puts food on the table. Both my husband and I, we both work full time on this. There is no other source of income other than the art and the creativity of what, what I do and what he helps me do uh, because we both work on, on, on our businesses. So turning off was not an option. While I was going through that, I found myself getting looser and looser in what I was painting. I've always said that I've been very inspired by abstract expressionists, artists like Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko. As much as people like to say, oh, Degas and the Impressionists are your biggest sources of inspiration because it kind of looks like that to somebody who is seeing the ballerina is like, oh, you must love Degas. No, the abstract expressionists, the Pollocks, the Rothko, de Kooning, that whole school, the New York school, they've always been my, my biggest source of inspiration. So I found myself kind of bridging the gap between that and I always come back to ballerinas. I don't know what it is. I think it's just, I have a hard time painting things without people in them because I find it very sad. So it's maybe an excuse for me to put a ballerina in there that gives it a focal point or some, some sort of energy that pulls it there. But this was the first in the series this year that I did that went in a direction that was not motivated by paying the bills or having a client or something in mind, I needed to paint for myself. So this one was Swan Lake, and Amgram was really the only paint that I was able to find that gave me the, the gas. It really felt like I had, it's hard to explain, I wanted to paint with oils, but I couldn't paint with oils because I have kids in the house. And I wanted that expression, that boldness, that color that you get, that, that, that strong intensity that you, you really only see from oil paintings. And M. Graham was able to get me there. This was another one. And again, if you squint and you even look at it upside down, it's not even a ballet scene anymore. You don't even know what it is. The ballet and the ballerinas help pull you to a focal point and take you to a place. But to me, this was really the me taking my emotions and just shoving them on my paintings. And it's kind of aggressive and it's kind of crazy. This one was one of, I think this one is called Reverence, which is curtsy, which is the final bow, the end of a show. This one, this one I did actually ended up doing on, on YouTube. This one was using the Christy Rice palette, which has these amazing neon colors. I was not used to painting with, but again, you can see here that the gloves have come off and I'm, I'm in a different place. I feel like I'm in a different mood and it's, there's something a little bit more manic about it too when you look at it. This one was Sleeping Beauty. This one is maybe a little bit more figurative, but really drawn to like these vertical lines and this geometry and this one point perspective that leads your eye there and there's this movement. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to explain how that transferred itself to my artwork. But I can show you, I guess, because this is where it went. This one was inspired by a painting that I saw of Marie Taglioni. She's an Italian ballet dancer arriving at a palazzo in Venice. And I saw that painting. I'm going to put a picture of the, of the painting that I saw, which is very different from this. And I wanted to put my own spin on it. And this is where I went. And as you can see, the colors are unhinged here. Here, I was playing a lot with, again, verticals. Do you see all the verticals happening? It's so interesting to see in the context of everything I was doing, just how much geometry, I wasn't thinking about it. I think I was just doing it because it felt right. This one is from a ballet, a New York City ballet. What is it? Oh gosh, I got the music in my head, but I can't remember for the life of me what it's called. 
This one didn't end up working out so well. I wasn't sure where I was going with this one. Then I did some studies. These were actually done at my kitchen table while feeding my, my daughter her dinner. I was just coming up with color schemes and trying to figure out interesting combinations to go in. Very expressionist. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of darkness. There's a lot of light. And I'm not really sure if I know where that was coming from. All right, so these are some studies. Not entirely there, still working on this idea. It's looking really flat and I'm not sure where it's going, but again, verticals, <laughs> coming back to it. Maybe this year I will tackle that some more. Quick study I did, kitchen table, feeding somebody. <laughs> Everything happens when I'm feeding somebody. That's really just what ends up happening right now, now nowadays. And then we got the bigger pieces. And so with the bigger pieces, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit with my camera so you can see just how big we're getting. Yeah, look at that. So for context, beginning of the year, end of the year. And there was something to me that also felt like as somebody who really wanted that expressionist gestural kind of thing, having something larger allowed me to use my whole body in the creation of something. So this one was a scene from Nutcracker. This is the Waltz of the Snowflakes, vertical lines again. So then we have this one. And this one was a painting of the Firebird. And this is another one where I just let loose. I mean, we really are in, a, in an area now here where I am, and it feels kind of funny talking about it. It feels very nearly uncomfortable because I feel like I'm bearing my soul here. There's so much emotion and um, of myself in here. And I, I again, I, I don't know, yet know how to describe it, um, but it feels like standing in front of people naked. <laughs> like It really does because it's not creating for other people. It really is just going with my instincts and the risk involved with that because there, there was a lot of risk involved, I feel. With, with this direction because it is so loose and it is so kind of just spilling it out there and just seeing what happens and letting go, which has been the theme of this year for me is letting go because I'm a Virgo. I'm somebody who holds on. I like to be in control of everything. That has helped me throughout my entire career and my throughout my entire life to be in control of situations. And this year has been the year where I've had to just let go of that, which has been incredibly frightening. And yet you see how maybe in a painting like this, letting go as much as it might sound really scary and like it might lead to failure can lead to some really interesting things. So that's it. Let me know in the comments below, maybe some of the things that you struggled with, or maybe some of the things that you're interested in exploring this year, whether it's personally, whether it's creatively, what will you be painting? What mediums will you be using? Because I am so curious and I would love, love, love to know. And if you enjoyed this video, I have another video just like this one, but of the previous year, so you can check that out. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and for joining me. I love and appreciate you so much, artist. Keep painting, keep being your wonderful creative self, and I'll see you in the next one.